this afternoon for the uh, session before coffee. Uh, we've got um, uh, Johnny Voon from Innovate uh, UK on uh, looking for the opportunities for digital business to thrive in uh, today's tech nation. Um, so we've got about uh, half an hour before, uh, before coffee. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Johnny Voon. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so I'm the lead technologist at Innovate UK. We just we fund, support, and connect people. Uh, that's all the sales spiel I'm going to do. Um, now it's very hard to provide um, an overview of the digital market for the UK, the tech nation. So I am going to go through this quite quickly. I'm also going to try and give a bit of a marmite presentation, right? So you're either going to love it or you hate it, but hopefully you will have some ideas and some opinions. I'd love to hear some questions. You can say you totally disagree, or you think I'm absolutely right, or you want to sit on the fence. It's up to you. So let's just start, firstly, with the UK, because you know, that's what I want to do. Um, and apologize for not being so Wales focused. Uh, but this is a stat that comes from, um, from the Department for Business, Innovation, and Skills. And 99.3%, well, actually, 99.3% um, of businesses uh, are small, medium enterprise. 96% of businesses are small, right? And this is based on the number of actual companies. 0.1% are actually large. Now, this is actually quite unique for the rest of the world. I mean, it's, it's so heavily skewed towards the small, medium, small businesses, especially, especially the zero to five um, employees, that we have this funny ecosystem of having a, a nation of startups and some really small one-man bands and very, very few large, large businesses. And so how do, we, how do we innovate and get people moving forwards in this nation so that we can help people grow? You heard about the, uh, the, the, the panel beforehand about how we get funding um, and we, we exit. But does exiting mean large business? Maybe not. Maybe an exit means you're still a small business. You're still in this 96%. So this is, again, another stat, and this is um, quite good for, uh, for Wales in, in some sense, uh, but it's the number of businesses per 10,000 residents. Okay, now, you obviously, you see London uh, at, at the centre there, at, at, the, at the very heart. Um, and Wales, you know, for a devolved um, sort of uh, administration, it's, it's doing all right, but it could be better. Um, and I would also like to focus, actually, on this. And this is actually mentioned as part of that Tech Nation report, right? So this was the, the percentage of change. Um, and the percentage of change of, of the increase year on year um, for last year was 12% increase in Wales. So that means the number of businesses in Wales are increasing compared to, you know, even doing better than London, whereas some areas, like Scotland, are definitely going down. Now, we are a nation of services, right? Would, would you agree? We're, we're a nation of services. We have a large number of, of those. And this is a breakdown of businesses based on their type. So you see at the very top, you have agriculture, manufacturing, construction. There's a large number of businesses there, but a large number of services. And you're probably thinking, well, hang on, I don't really see digital there. Apart from ICT, is there, there's no digital service. And that's because digital is across all that. Um, and it's been something that digital entrepreneurs know, have known for a very, very long time, that the businesses, business opportunities are not called digital, right? They're called Hospitality, finance and insurance, real estate, they're called education, health and social work. They are the digital opportunities. Now, that's great for a digital entrepreneur like yourselves, I'm sure, and an investor like yourselves. What happens if you're in the health and social work sector or the construction and manufacturing sector? Do you see yourself as a digital business? We're now in an age where buildings are now physical data stores. They hold personal data. Things like building information management, for example, and the Internet of Things means a building, a car, uh, you know, a, a washing machine if you want it, um, can hold and store personal information about you. It's a data store. It's a digital um, asset now. So why haven't those sectors now suddenly stuck their hand and goes, yes, we're a digital sector. Just because we build buildings doesn't mean we don't have a digital presence. Just because we treat people in a hospital doesn't mean we're not digital business. Okay? And that's the shift that we haven't quite made yet. And that's the thing that's really going to drive this digital economy. So I have this, uh, this, this slide, and this kind of represents um, the view from Innovate UK. And, and bear in mind that I have my Innovate UK hat on here. So um, when I talk about innovation and funding, opportunities and those sort of things, it's what we see as, as innovation agency. So at the very bottom, we have, these, uh, we have these capabilities. And these are things like quantum computing, ICT, sensors, and all those sort of things. And these are you know, typically very tech-based. So they're, they're, they're you know, silicon-based and so forth. 
And then you've got these competencies which businesses will have, and these are things like IoT, big data, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and so forth. Um, they're, they're kind of the, the service layer that services everyone else. And, and here, then we have the challenges, right, which traditionally people don't think of as digital. Right, their health, transport, energy, um, you know, uh, built environment, you know, agriculture and food, and creative services, creative industries. Now, I'm a firm believer that revolution is followed by evolution, especially in the digital space. And let me exp explain that. We've gone through the digital revolution of the internet, okay? And so that appeared, and we go, great, we've got the internet, what do we do with it? Uh, I think we send these email things, right? Or we browse the web. And that then raises this level of evolution of services and that build up around this revolution of the technology. Look at mobile phones. We've got mobile phones, great, what do we do with them? Well, we can make phone calls. And that's driven smartphones and the rise of apps and so forth. So when we look at this, we have, when we have the revolution of quantum computing, for example, or an ICT in senses, that leads to an evolution into the competencies that brings up things like big data, that brings up things like Internet of Things, that brings up you know, mobile commerce and all those sort of aspects. Right? So that, that sort of revolution, technology revolution, drives that evolution into the layer above it. And same with Internet of Things and, and that kind of competencies layer. We have this revolution of IoT. What is IoT? We, we've got lots of sensors and, and we're getting all this data, but how can we make money from it? What do we do with that sort of thing? And that does the evolution into, oh, we, we use it for healthcare, we use it for transport, we use it for and so forth and so forth and so forth. And that is what drives that value chain as you move from the revolution to the evolution of digital services. So the question I pose to you is, if you're a digital business you're, and you're an entrepreneur, are you revolutionizing your industry or are you in the evolution part of it? It doesn't mean that you, you, you can choose to be um, one or the other. You can be both if you want. But typically, you'll be at either the forefront of technology development, changing something, making something so unique, so different, that no one has ever done that before, bringing to light new, new um, ways of working, or actually new, new technologies, new algorithms, whatever it is, or are you in the process of taking what is there and transforming uh, the, cap the, cap the competencies or the capabilities above you or the challenges above you? Are you, are you taking that into a new business model? Are you taking that into a new sector that no one has ever seen before and thought, wow, that's really unique? Right? Because each of those have different monetary streams than where you go down. Each of those have different opportunities. Each of those have different types of investors that look at, at your market size. Um, the Internet of Things is a very good example. You know, you look at analysts and they talk about um, number of connected devices, right? For those of you that kind of, you know, what IoT is. And, they, and the, the number ranges anywhere from 50 billion in 2020 to 200 billion, right? And that's basically an analyst going, I think it's about this number somewhere up here. And it's not quite at the top, it's not quite at the bottom, so I'll choose the middle, right? So that's talking about the revolution of the Internet of Things. What they don't get is the evolution what is the actual monetary value to a business, to healthcare, to transport, and so forth, when we look at these digital services? And that's very key. Whatever your industry you are in, in the digital side of it, there is we a revolution and an evolution. And you know, if you know where you play, you will know where your market is. So let's talk about innovation, because um, that's kind of what we do at Innovate UK. We, we help fund innovation. Um, and um, I don't want to teach anyone here to suck eggs or anything, but here are just my insights and, uh, on innovation. So, we have what is, on the very top left, um, information that is important and unknown. It's what we call undiscovered information, right? We, we don't know what it is. I'm sure it's important, but I have, it's not, it doesn't exist in anyone's brain. On the right-hand side, we have what is important and known. So it's, it's common knowledge. You know, you know that. You know that um, you know, your phone will run out of uh, power at a certain time. It's, you know, it's kind of important, but, and you know how it's going to happen. At the very bottom right is this unimportant and known. It's trivial. You know, I don't care if everyone knows it, everyone, and, and it means nothing, absolutely nothing to me. And the very bottom left is unimportant and unknown. It's irrelevant. You know, no one needs to know it. Even if you knew it, it's, it's trivial, so I don't care. So where is innovation on this scale? Right? Because when you're looking at digital business, when you're looking to innovate, you need to put you, you, your, what, you're, what you're doing sits in one of these boxes at some point. So really, it sits here, right? The majority of innovation is at the tail end of what is of important and unknown, i.e. it's just on the cusp of, of, of getting that idea. You've got the brilliant idea, no one else knows it, right? It's really important, no one else knows what it's going on about. As you bring it through this product development life cycle, as you start to bring it to market, it starts, everyone goes, oh yeah, well actually that's a really good idea. And its value, which is that kind of triangle, starts to diminish because all of a sudden, everyone else knows it. It's important, so therefore everyone's doing it. 
right? Um, look, at, look, at the, look at the iPad, right? Although the iPad, people knew that they had tablets beforehand, Apple said, hey, we've got this great thing, it's an iPad. Everyone's like, wow, that's really important. I never knew that I could do that with a, it's like, you know, a nine inch screen before. It's fantastic. And then you've got copycats and all of a sudden kind of the value starts to, and the novelty and the level of innovation starts to diminish because it becomes common knowledge. Is this kind of making sense? I'm not, I'm not talking any rubbish or anything? Okay, great, fantastic. So, um, the UK is great at research. We've got one of the best research bases in the world. We're good at innovation, right? We've got a very innovative um, environment. Um, we tend not to be so good at commercialization, strange enough. And this is what we see at Innovate UK, right? So we see a lot of businesses that have great ideas and how do we then take that out to the market? How do we then change the world? One of the things I'm working on, for example, uh, is, is hardware, so um, IoT hardware. Um, and we've noticed that we do, we do great software and services and platforms and all these sort of, you know, this whole service layer, the software layer, it's fantastic. But when it comes to hardware, we're being trumped by the US, by the China and other places. People are going even to Germany to go to those sort of places. So why is the UK struggling with that? Why are we struggling to commercialize these ideas? Why is it that we can get people to the point whereby they go, we've, we've done all the work, we've got the platform, we've got the tools, we just need the funding and we can't quite get that first customer. We can't quite get beyond that breach whereby we become a household name. Right? There's, there's, there's a few British companies that have gone and been, been acquired and become household names, um, but not all of us can be the next arm. Right? Not all of us can be the next Newell and so forth. Um, so how do we make that leap to commercialization whereby we are successful in that sense? Um, I also want to touch on this. This is a traditional software development life cycle. All right. So if you're any of you in the software business traditionally, um, large companies will go through this, this sort of huge requirements analysis with um, business analysts. They'll go through design, the implementation, the testing, and so forth. And it's iterative. And if you've ever worked for a large software company like Oracle and IBM and so forth, this process will take months, sometimes years, to get the first release out. Now, as a digital innovator, especially in the software side of it, you'd rather have this, right? You'd rather have, it's a very basic diagram, I like basic diagrams, um, high market advantage when you release it, and as you release it, the, as the time to market goes, um, you still have that kind of advantage, but it tapers away because it's, you know, it's been out in the market for a while. But ideally, you want a huge market advantage. So that sweet spot, that blue area, is your ideal preference. However, rarely does it work in a slightly funny graph like that. So, um, introducing what I call Dimple, I just made this up uh, a couple of weeks ago actually, so I trademarked that name. It's called the Digital In-Market Prototyping and Evaluation Lifecycle. Okay, so bear with me while I explain it. So, we've got these two axes. We've got um, the commercial interest and market advantage up there, and this time to market product readiness. And it, we, as you see, we go through these cycles, right? So, you release the product and it kind of drops away because it's actually, it's not really that ready. Not really that ready. Uh, and so, the, the, the interest kind of disappears and it, peaks and troughs, and that can be matched by a couple of things. So firstly, you create the market. This is especially the case for those of you developing apps, right? Apps in quickfire software. You put it out there, it's version 0.1. You, all of a sudden, everyone goes, wow, that's the best app ever. You know, you get press coverage. Everyone goes, that's fantastic, it's brilliant. But then you realize, actually, that's, there, there are a lot of bugs, right? And version 0.1 should not have been released. It was terrible. It, you know, it doesn't work in, in most other languages. It has no, you know, poor user experience. All of a sudden, you you know, you kind of get left behind. So you bring out the next one, you bring out these bug fixes, and everyone's going, well, it's a little bit better, you know, you, you've got some market advantage, um, but then you get your copycats that begin to appear, right? Those who go, oh, we can do that. Look at the likes of uh, Flappy Bird, for example, right? The, the, those of you that played that game, Candy Crush, and those sort of things. You get these copycats that start to appear. Your market advantage, you may have a bit of brand, but your market advantage begins to start, start to drop. So then you get user feedback, um, and you, um, and you, you, know, you make the next version, and finally, you, you, know, you become this sort of old news. Oh, here we go again, it's version two, you know, nothing really new about this, just some bug fixes, some things that really should have been there in the first place. And that's when you get to that final stage where finally you've, ideally, you've created this ecosystem around you. Right, you've got a product in a, in a great um, area um, that it becomes novel. And I like to think of um, those of you who use Evernote, right, if you ever use Evernote, it's kind of in this, it's taken this cycle whereby it came out the first time and was like, wow, it's fantastic, I could take notes on a touch screen. Um, okay, well, yeah, that's, 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 that's new. And then it kind of dropped away as there were lots of bugs and so forth. And now there's an ecosystem around Evernote. You can buy accessories for Evernote. It's integrated with all the other, um, you know, directly into you know, some smartphones and so forth. Um, so it has this kind of ecosystem around it. And as you notice that the time for development takes longer, right? The, product, the time to market takes longer to get out. 
And as much as we'd like to go straight to the ecosystem side, unfortunately, you've got to go through these trials and challenges. Right? You've got to go to the point where you get copycats, where you do bug fixes, where you get negative press, where you become old news, and finally, hopefully, you make it to that side whereby you have an ecosystem around you or you are the, a part of a bigger ecosystem. So I want to talk about the landscape. Um, and this is, uh, again, another simple graph that I came up with. Um, so firstly, we've got... Um, Innovation areas in the landscape that are industry specific at the very top or very cross cutting, okay? Um, and what we do in the long term versus what we do in the short term. Now, this is um, something that, that I've seen and does, may not necessarily reflect what you see as your own views. So, we see, especially in Innovate UK, in the digital economy side of it, three aspects in this type. So, firstly, digital health. Right. Digital health is a massive market for reasons such as wearables, which I'll come into. Um, but unfortunately, it's so industry specific, so it requires the health industry, right? People that do wearables that want to break into the health industry struggle with um, having a, a, um, a robust, almost medical grade piece of equipment or something that can integrate with legacy systems or something that requires type approval or something that requires you know, um, a, a lengthy process, a lengthy evaluation process that their business isn't there to be prepared for. And that's a characteristic of industry specific um, innovation. And the same thing with 5G, right? So 5G currently, we don't know what 5G is. It's such a long, it's you know, currently in technology terms, a long way away, it's 2018 at the earliest, um, and it's still very industry specific. It's aimed at the telcos. Um, so people that are innovating in that landscape are typically innovating at the technology level. They're doing the revolution level as opposed to the evolution level. And they've kind of got creative industries in there, actually. Um, and I was tempted to bump creative industries further down because although it's, you know, people think of it as gaming and visual effects and so forth, it's actually even more cross-cutting. So you have what's called the creative industries and the creative economy, right? The creative industries are those that work in gaming, visual effects, advertising, and so forth, and design. And the creative economy are for those who work in design, but not necessarily in the creative industries. So you could be a designer of uh, product packaging at Tesco, for example, right? It doesn't mean you're not creative. It just means you're not necessarily in the creative industries, but you're part of the creative economy. So the next quadrant, we have these areas which tend to be a lot more cross-cutting and very typically digital, apologies for those that, that can't see that, um, but they tend to be a little bit more longer term, right? So things like retail, which, you know, the innovation levels that take uh, place in retail take a little bit longer than normal because retailers typically slow to act, right? They think having a web page means I'm digital and that's not quite the same thing. So getting their mindsets changed take a little bit longer. Location-based services, open data, cloud computing, for example. Where is the next innovation in cloud computing? Yes, it's cross-cutting. Yes, it's, it's fantastic for digital, but what happens next? Where, where is the next big revolution or the evolution? Because at the moment, all we see is we use cloud computing on a daily basis. What's new about that? So where is the opportunity? So the further to the right you go, the more you need to start looking at revolution rather than evolution. Okay, So they're, they're actually making massive technology changes. Same with user experience, cybersecurity, and so forth. Then you've got these things here, which are um, very, very short term. Things like quantified self, wearable technologies, immersive environments, right? Uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and so forth. And these are characterized by mature technology, right? The, the revolution has taken place. We've got the Fitbits, we've got the, um, you know, the, the virtual reality headsets or the Oculus Rifts. So where is the evolution? How can we quickly find those markets whereby we can make those, um, those quick gains, make that money in the education and so forth sectors? Um, we've got things like, uh, that are very relevant, that are happening sort of here and now, things like personal data, sharing economy, trust and IoT, um, very cross-cutting um, and has a lot of work being taking place. And finally, the sort of um, outliers such as fintech and edtech. You know, so the financial industry, sort of fast moving, lots of money to go involved, so much regulation, um, but the appetite is there. So, you know, Apple Pay just announced uh, for the UK. How will that, that is not a revolution because that's NFC. What is the evolution trend for that, right? How does that evolve into an actual service if you're someone using sort of uh, mobile payments and contactless payments, for example? And same with education technology as well. So, uh, let's cover geography. And I'm not going to cover every sector that I talked about and across all of the UK, because that would just take too long. But I just want to highlight a couple of key things. Um, so the UK, as you can see. Um, so I want to talk about 5G. Uh, now 5G, as you see, there's a little bit happening in Bristol, in the South Wales side of it, but it is very, very niche. So if you are looking in the 5G space, unless you're one of those areas, you will struggle. And typically, they're characterized by academia. Right? So some of these topics where they are in the revolutionary space are characterized by large academic 
involvement. So if you're looking to innovate or, or look at the opportunities in those areas, it helps being near a university. Um, IoT, Internet of Things, right? That's at the evolutionary, uh, at the beginning of the evolutionary stage. As a result, it's everywhere, right? People are saying, I'm an IoT business, I can do that. I've got a smart light bulb, I've got a smart plug, I've got a smart car, I've got whatever it is. So as a result, businesses are everywhere, including South Wales, but up and down the country. And these are just ones that we have, uh, we know of that we've funded. Uh, and of course, it's, it's bound to be all up and down the UK. But again, at the evolutionary stage, it's across the UK. Um, cybersecurity, again, one of my topics. Again, cybersecurity is at the evolutionary space. Nothing is revolutionary about that. We're just going about finding practical applications for that in different sectors. So as a result, it's all over the place, across Northern Ireland, Scotland, you know, and, and UK, and, and England. Um, creative industries and economy. Now, this one is interesting, because you would think creative industries is a revolutionary thing. You know, we have... Um, uh, a great creative industries, whether it be things like Industrial Light and Magic um, and the visual effects firm, where you know, the, one of the best in the world, um, the nation's the best in the world creative industries. Um, but why is it so centered down the south? You know, is this because we're still in the, in the revolutionary phase? Are we still building tech? Um, and the answer is a bit of both, right? The creative industries is evolutionary by getting media out into smartphones, for example. Right? They're great at engaging with audiences, great at engaging you in the cinema and your phone, your tablet at home, advertising, whatever it is. That's very evolutionary. But in terms of internal processes, in terms of the way they work, they are very, very 1990s. Right? Just until recently, I was working with um, uh, a very, one of the largest um, visual effects firms uh, that does advertising and, 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 and sort of graphics design. And they told me how they get, they ship um, content around to uh, developers around the world. Um, they either send it via mail, or if it's on a plane, they get a magnetic tape drive, they get an intern on the plane, and they deliver it through plane. Like, wh why? You know, we are in the digital age. You are the part of the digital economy. Why are you still doing things by tape drives? Why are you still doing things by hand delivering things? Why aren't you using things like the cloud, right? So they're still in this... Um, revolutionary stage of going, oh, wow, we can do all these great things that, uh, with, you know, with modern technology. So hence why, unfortunately, you see this cluster of, 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 um, of people down there, because traditionally they've been, you know, well, they're only around the corner, so I'll work with them instead of having to ship something, you know, uh, four hours up the road. So as that changes, then you'll start to see, as it becomes the evolutionary process, then you begin to see these, these maps, the heat maps, become around the place as they realize, actually, we can use cloud, we can use distributed computing, we can use all these, this big data. So uh, that was it for me. Any questions? Because uh, I've left lots of time. Hopefully that was um, slightly controversial. If not, I haven't done my job that well. Um, but any questions, thoughts? I mean you want to say you totally disagree or you want me to go back a few slides to take a screenshot? Anyone? Sure. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's say you are looking for funding and you don't want to give away part of your business uh, and you're looking for free money. Right, um, which is fantastic. Um, I think Innovate UK is one of the, probably the closest you can get to getting free money. It's difficult because you know nothing, nothing free comes easy. Um, but Innovate UK, we we fund, we grant fund you, so we don't we don't give we don't give you a loan. We don't want you to pay any money back. Um, we don't want to invest in your company. We don't want any share of your company. We don't want any intellectual property. Right, you just go ahead and do your thing. So you're thinking, well, you get so I, you give me money. You don't want any share of my company, and you don't want you to pay it back. It sounds too good to be true. And there, there's a little bit of work to be done. So what we need from you is either you come to us and you say to, to us, we've got a great idea, and it's about developing a, a proof of concept uh, or a proof of market or doing a prototype, um, and you'll, you'll you know, fill out a form, we'll get assessed, and we'll say you know, yes or no, kind of you get the funding. Or we have these larger challenges. So you know, on, on this uh, slide back here, I'm just going to put it in the back, I hate doing this normally. Um, uh, this slide here, everything in the bottom right, traditionally, down here, are ones where we, because it's such long term, we will have uh, these thematic calls around cybersecurity. So I just finished one on around cybersecurity. Um, and I will say, hey, I've got a challenge that needs to be solved in the next two to three years around protecting data in industry. Um, do, you got, do you have any ideas? And you can come to me, and then you, 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 know, you basically fill out an application form, um, you know, and if you're successful, you get funding to take place to do innovation over two or three years. But you remember that the government 
is not in the business of bankrolling your company. The government is not in the business of giving you a leg up over your competitors. At the end of the day, you still need to come up with that business model that says, I can make money from this in the future, right? I, as instead of, I need the government money to go all the way through. If you can do that beforehand, fantastic. And hence why, the, are you in the revolutionary stage or the evolutionary stage? Are you creating this market, creating the technology, or are you taking the technology and, and evolving it and putting it into one of the industry-specific areas, such as healthcare, so forth? Okay. Any questions? Well, actually, I see the, one of the biggest opportunities taking place in the agricultural and food space right, for, for digital. Um, we're already seeing things like you know, using um, cloud computing and, and, and big data to look at um, food production, for example. Um, one of the big transformational areas is this, this looking at the entire value chain of, as people become aware of, where does my food come from and so forth, right? the, the data that, that flows through. Um, the, the efficiencies that can be gained in traditionally an analog environment by digital. Right, then that, that's where digital has had its most amount of gain in, in the past. So things like healthcare, which is very much about people, and, and you know, sure, I can walk around with an iPad, but there's not much digital engagement. Same with agriculture. So I think if you are, if you are innovating in that space, things like 5G, like IoT, and those sort of assets, big data, cloud computing, if you can make it relevant for that industry, because a farmer won't understand what cloud computing is and big data and metadata is, they, that's not their language, right? Um, if you can make it relevant to them and talk about improvements and efficiencies and, what, how, and how much more milk they can produce or how much more they can grow or you know, whatever it is there, is, there is a big, big market there because not many people are playing in that space. Because, as you rightly put, all the innovation, people think, I've got to be in London. I've got to be doing it in London. It's got to be quick. It's got to be digital. It's got to be apps. It's got to be software. It's got to be you know, that, that aspect. And they're thinking, they're trying to do um, evolution with revolution, right? They're trying to play in this market, but try and um, create new, new tech without actually thinking about how they play. Whereas if you look at it from, almost from the top down, from the evolution stage, where do I want it to go? Where is the tech there? If the tech's not there, then I go into the, into the revolution stage. I develop that tech. Okay? Then... Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Um, one thing that, before I answer that, is that people tend to ignore is user experience, right? And people putting the person at the heart of it. So good user experience, in theory, you should get rid of some of this because it's such a good user experience. And, and my colleague who looks after user experience describes user experience as it's these three phases, right? So the first stage is it's functional. It does what it says on the tin which is pretty much at the very beginning, right? It, it kind of does, it does it, but there's lots of bugs. The second stage is it's usable. I, I can use it, you know, it, it becomes slightly intuitive and I, I like what it is. And the third stage is it's desirable. I really want to use it. And that's that ecosystem stage, right? That's the stage whereby I can't live without this app, software, platform, whatever it is. So as you're going through, you can make these, um, that time frame shorter and the dips less if you put in things like good user experience, right? If you take into account things like people's privacy and security and consent, which at the moment, if you're, looking, if you're doing an app, you give away your data for free, right? Sign with Facebook, sure, not a problem. Um, agree to notifications, sure, not a problem. Use your email address, sure, not a problem. Now, that has the potential to impact you like that drop, um, just like user experience, right? So when someone realizes, actually, your data is leaking off overseas somewhere, for example, that's gonna give you bad feedback. That's gonna make you old news. That's gonna lose you that market advantage until you fix that. And then you're always trying to repair that damage, right? So it's things like, it's just working on those principles, to be honest. It's the very basic principles that aren't drilled into developers these days, for example, for apps, aren't drilled into um, digital innovators to think user experience, good you know, security, design, um, consent, and those sort of things. Okay.
Any questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I believe we are going for coffee uh, about now, so I'll be around afterwards, but thank you very much for your time. <laughs>